Hello, and welcome to the Digital Workspace Works podcast. I'm Ryan Purvis, your host, supported by our producer, Heather Bicknell. In this series, you'll hear stories and opinions from experts in the field, stories from the front lines, the problems they face and how they solve them, the areas they're focused on from technology, people and processes, to the approaches they took that will help you to get to the scripts for the digital workspace inner workings. Melissa to the Digital Workspace Works podcast. Do you want to give us a brief intro? Yeah, uh, my name is Melissa Kwan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of eWebinar. Uh, eWebinar saves people from doing the same repetitive webinar over and over again for demos, onboarding, trainings, things like that. Um, this is my third startup and my third remote team startup. Uh, so I've been doing this um, remotely for a little over 12 years now before it was cool. <laughs> so <laughs> that's great oh, and so, uh i have been a digital nomad for about four years so digital okay, workspace is of course um not just important but like imperative to our business so maybe, maybe kick off with where are you right now uh, i am in amsterdam so actually after a few years of traveling around and you know with the pandemic and stuff we needed kind of a home base um and we fell in love with amsterdam and if it wasn't for the all the airport chaos, chaos and things like that, we would still be traveling. But I think this summer we're just going to stay put. Oh, good. And um, you said three, three startups all in the same sort of space or, or different things? Yeah. So the, fir- uh, the first two were in uh, real estate tech. Um, the first one actually was was a product company, but you know, we turned into an agency because we said yes to a lot of things and then became, you know, a custom apps company, but it was in the real estate tech space. Second one as well, that was re- uh, that was acquired in 2019. Uh, and eWebinar was a company I started right after that company was acquired. Okay. And what drove you to eWebinar if, if you were in real estate? I mean, we were in a real estate SaaS space, right? So it was real estate tech, but it was still like a SaaS company. And people here that are listening, um, if you have a tech company, you'd know that, uh, you know, demos, onboarding, training, things like that are, are important to make sure your customers are educated on the product, stay on it, and, you know, for lowering churn and increasing conversion. So I was actually the person that was delivering all of these live through, like, back then go to webinar or whatever webinar software I could find that that didn't suck. Um, and then it was Zoom, right? So I lived the problem of doing, like, repetitive live webinars over and over and also doing them at different time zones, like opposite time zones, because most of my customers were in North America, but I was traveling around the world. So eWebinar was just a product that I had dreamt to exist when I was in my in my previous life. Um, and after that company was acquired, like I just couldn't believe that something like this, you know, in the way that I envisioned still didn't exist while all these companies were pouring money into live broadcast right? Like whether it be Zoom or Restream or Facebook Live or Instagram Live, like all these companies were were just pouring money into it. And nobody was really solving the biggest problem in in this kind of broadcast was like, how do you scale that? Like, if I don't want to do this live every single time, like what is my alternative? Right? So that was what got me to start this company um, about three years ago. And are you focusing on the the enablement piece, so, so it's, a, it's a customer that's, that's already signed up and now they've been onboarded, or is it? As, are you including the um, the product marketing webinars as well that that feed into the you know convincing someone to buy and then then be onboarded? I mean, it's both, right? It's it's just a product that has so many different use cases, and I struggle with that as well because you know as a marketer, right? Like you may know that the most popular thing that people say is like focus on one whether it's like focus on one channel, right? One industry, one line of business, whatever that might be. But ultimately like our customers choose how they want to use the product. Like that's why we say it's for, you know, sales demos, onboarding and training, because that that really is what it's for. Like while the majority of our customers would use it for like post sales, right? Like trading, onboarding, feature updates, things like that. But sales and marketing lead gen teams are using this to deliver their demos. Like I don't do live demos. Our demo is delivered through eWebinar. Otherwise, like, I'm not supporting my own product, right? Like, I don't do, um, like, if people ask me for a demo, I just send them to to our on-demand demo. But, yeah, like, I think ultimately people just choose, like, what 
what this product is is best for. And it could be when I when it's you know product marketing, it could be very much like a conversation that you have with your customer, which is not like a really like a direct sales pitch, but it is something that people do maybe now once a quarter, once every half year, but with the webinar, they can do it like literally every day. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to, as, you, as you're talking, I'm mapping it to the to the life I'm living at the moment, which is with a <laughs> um, a software company SaaS based, and we've just built out a whole demo environment, and a key part of that is the videos. So yeah. we've got um, a fairly technical product in that it's 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 measuring desktop performance, application usage, um, what customers are browsing, you know, network traffic, that sort of thing. Now that's the nitty gritty, but the, the important piece is that all that information, when you actually start using it to make decisions, is quite valuable. You know, what kind of tools should I buy for my, my employees? What kind of applications should I have available for them as a default? Which applications should I buy on demand? Which, which can I negotiate license deals on? All those sorts of things. And when we, when we built out the environment, one of the key things was we wanted to speed up that sales process because mm-hmm. Every customer tended to be a, a complicated process. Meanwhile, he was showing the, the same basic things to begin with, yeah. each one. Yeah. Now, once you get past those basic things, you know, can you detect an application that's crashed? Can you detect slow login time? Can you detect which applications have been used? You then get to a much more mature conversation, which is, I know you can do all the basic things, but now can you do this thing that I want? And that's where you go into a much more deeper yeah. demo. So, so I can see it in that sense. Uh, having the canned demos recorded makes a lot of sense and, and it's very helpful. Um, a key part for us is the customers need to play with the tool too. So hence they have an yeah. environment to play with it now, so sandbox. But I wonder, I mean, is that the next step for you in some respects with some customers? Would you would you be directing and, and managing that interaction through to a sandbox and collecting, say, surveys and feedback and, and bringing that back to CRM? Or is that outside of what your product would do? No, that's that's totally within scope, right? So basically what eWebinar does is super simple. We take a video and we yeah. turn it into a webinar, like an interactive webinar that your customers can join either on demand or they can choose a time in the future that actually fits their schedule. To give you an example of, of why that matters, like the average attendance rate across all of our customers is 65%. Now, anyone that's run a webinar will know that is outrageous. Like the yeah, industry standard, I think it's like sub 25% and people get bored and then they, they drop off. But a primary reason why people can't attend is because your webinar is happening next Tuesday, 11 in London, but I'm in San Francisco. Mm. So I'm going to sign up to get the replay, but how many replays are just sitting in inboxes never touched, right? Like our, our inboxes are like replay graveyards, right? So that is the, the one thing why having a <laughs> recurring flexible schedule actually matters for the customer. They can actually show up. Uh, but number two is we don't just deliver the video because otherwise it would just be like a YouTube video or like a Wistia with a schedule, right? What we what we allow our hosts to do is program in things like polls, questions, tips, resources that people can actually engage with. So the eWebinar experience, it's not like logging into a Zoom and then I'm talking at you for 45 minutes. The attendee can actually play with, you know, the polls, resources, answer questions, click on different things, go elsewhere. So now it's more of a participatory experience, right? So now I am encouraging you to stay till the end where my CTA is going to be. And so you've kind of hit the nail on the head where like, yeah, some enterprise products aren't, you know, the CTA isn't sign up on your own, right? My product is because it starts at 50 bucks, right? So for me, like I don't need to have another, a separate call. But a lot of our enterprise customers, they do their top of the funnel, like general, hey, here are the general things of what our company does and what our product does. And this is how we compete. If you want to book a call, here's our calendar. So the benefit of that is you've just saved yourself 20 minutes of going Mm. through, you know, the general stuff. And when someone does book a call, you know that they are pre-qualified because they pre-qualified themselves. They've gone through your 20 minutes and they know that they want to talk to you. And once they talk to you, they're just asking you a few questions before they're like, okay, give me the sandbox account. Or if your sandbox account is something that you're willing to give your prospect to sign up on their own, you can just program in an interaction. That's what we call like these interaction cards that pop up to have them sign up on their own. But either way, it's about like letting your customers do their own research because nowadays, like 
not only are we kind of shifting into the, the digital workspace ourselves as you know workers, right? Our customers are also doing that. Like one of my favorite stats is is by Trust Radius, and and I think it goes something like eighty seven percent of buyers want to do their own research during the buying journey, and fifty seven percent of people already make purchases without talking to a salesperson. So if we think about ourselves as consumers and not salespeople. When was the last time you're like, oh, I really want to talk to a salesperson, right? So even if you want to buy TV, like what's the first thing you do, right? You put it out to your friends. Hey, do you guys have any suggestions? And you might do your own research, right? So that's no different than how we want to purchase any product today. So I think the companies that understand that will and and act accordingly right align your communication and the transparency of your information to your customer's expectation like that's your differentiation from from your customers uh, yeah i mean those stats don't surprise me at all you know i'm on a few few sort of community peer groups or whatever and there are conversations there about do you know this product do you know this vendor rick you know and it's literally a thumb up thumbs down response yeah. and, and then if people want more detail they'll, they'll have a direct communication on it and I also think one of the reasons why we went down the route of building an environment is people want to play at their own speed. Now, there are there are lots of people that will sign up for a trial that will never touch it. Yeah, um, but that, that pains but also, me. <laughs> yeah, it does. But, but I also think that there's a level of just you having a trial environment almost brings a confidence that you are prepared to put yourself out there. Now, there's a, there's a level of do my competitors see what I've got? Yes. Sure, you are exposing yeah. yourself on that front, but that's almost an acceptable risk as long as you're aware of you've got the risk. But I also think for a customer, and, and you know, I was a customer of this product for a long time, just having that environment ticks the box to maturity that you, you've you got something. Uh, yeah. Then I'll also look at, you know, the, the, and it is inbox hell, but you'll get all the nurturing emails and you'll see what the nurturing emails have to say. And that's also subconsciously helping you reinforce whether that's something you would trust or not trust. And I think that's what this comes down to. And I liked what you said about the multiple time zones and making it accessible to a customer at the, on, in, at the, in their time and when they want to, because that's one of the, the problems with this new way of working is, you know, the technology has sped up our, 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 well, it's enhanced our ability to have back-to-back -back meetings. And, and all these webinars and all the rest of it clash with another meeting that you've already got to be in. And at the time of, of, of signing in to watch their webinar, you've almost got to decide, do I need to do the webinar or do I need to do the XYZ <laughs> meeting? Uh, yeah. And that's why most people don't attend them. And I don't think that's ever going to improve. But if you can get to another way of doing it, which, which it sounds like you've, you've maybe cracked the, the nut on, uh, I think that's a good thing. Well, I think the, I, the first thing you said that, that I want to respond to was, was, like, should you have your information out there for your competitors, right? There are so many people that are so afraid of that. Like, let me tell you, your, your competitors already know what you're doing and you know what they're doing. That's why you have an opportunity to differentiate your product. And yeah. like transparency in this day and age, when customers are already doing the research, you like, you have to assume that your customer already knows what's out there, but they're still talking to you. And so you, I, I think people have to have more confidence in that. And I think especially a lot of enterprise companies, they hide their pricing. You can't get a demo if you don't book a calendar, like a book to book a time on their calendar, right? Like, but what's the point? Like you might as well let your customers do their research and give them the information when they're already looking, because if your competitor's doing that and you're making it hard for them, like that's part of the experience I think they're gonna remember. So you might as well be like prepared, I think, to answer any questions about your competitors. I think that's number one. But definitely like with with the time zones and stuff, I think people, um, we live in a world right now where we want to work remote, right? Like we, like ne the Netherlands actually has just made working from home a right. I don't know what that actually oh, means, but they just did that last week. So I think it's something like if you can work remote, you like if your job allows you to work remote, then your employer has to consider it or something like that. I don't know how that's going to be enforced, but it's becoming more and more important to make sure that your content is available, not just to your customers, but to your staff. Right. Yeah. Like we, we have a lot of companies that also use this for internal onboarding. Right. Instead of like, hey, come to this orientation and not everyone's going to make that. 
you know, by making that available, it's not just good for your, your customers. It's also good for your team. Yeah. No, I mean, spot on. It, it, it's resonating because of, this is all the reasons why we just built this environment is internal training, external training, partners, you know, because it, it makes it more sticky because there's, there's a, it, instead of it being slideware, it's interactive. And, and when you said interactive, I wanted to pick that up with you that, and, and you explained it very well, but it's, it's got to be bi-directional. As you said, polls, questions, answers. Uh, I mean, maybe, I, I don't know how, how deep your product goes, but even potentially leading them down to watch different videos based on what they've watched, but what they've watched previously or set videos you wanted to watch in order and then specialization videos. Yeah, we're, we're not doing like choose your own adventure. I think there are like another, there's another type of company that does that. Um, it's more yeah. like, it's more like um, I, I've seen like training companies that actually, uh, that actually do that. And, and the thing is like, Honestly, the biggest lift with our product is getting people to make their first video. Like when you talk about people that sign up for trials and never touch the product, our biggest obstacle is people creating their first piece of content. So you can imagine like if we require them to create five pieces of content, like how that will (laughs) never work. But what we are working on is like conditional interactivity. So if you answer the poll this way, then a question pops up. And you, you did mention something that I didn't address, which is connecting to your CRM. So we connect with multiple different CRMs, also through Zapier as well. So you can imagine the amount of data that's being mm-hmm. not just collected, but also tracked in, in your system. So um, a way that could be used is if Ryan answers the poll this way, then trigger this email sequence. Or if he watches until 65%, then send X. If he clicked on this button, but didn't buy, then send this. Right. That's all, all that is is also possible. Um, I love what you said about creating like um, an environment for people to actually play with. That's something that we wanted to do, because the biggest obstacle is if you don't create a video, you can't create your first webinar. So how can we get you to that first aha moment? Because the first yeah. aha moment is somebody running a webinar without being in front of the camera like that is for someone that's used to running webinars. That is such a magical moment. Right, to be able to answer the chats while you're in your pajamas or, you know, you wake up and you've got a few unanswered chats and you respond by email like that moment is so magical. But if you don't have a video, how are you going to get there? And and we've done things like integrate with Zoom so you could pull in your previous recordings so people know that they can use an old recording. But like some people do start there, but they don't want to end there. They always want to create their own video. But the lift is so high. Right. And the thing is, if you don't have any attendees, you can't answer the chat. And then you also don't get to that magical moment. So we have talked a lot about like, how do we create that environment so people can experience it without having any attendees? Like, how do we mimic that environment? So it is something we've talked about. It's it's probably a much larger project than we can take on right now with like wanting to build you know new features and stuff. But I, I like what you said about like letting people experience the product like right away. Yeah, I was, I, the one question I had was, how do you get people to create their first video? I mean, do you do you offer? I mean, I'm assuming you have some sort of tutorial that you can offer them, but then maybe are there are there um, referred experts that they could use, you know, sort of on a Fiverr or one of those by the by the hour websites? The difference between a webinar and like an educational video platform is webinars yeah. are very casual, right? People yeah. people record them on Zoom or Descript or Loom, like. The, the reason why I think people like webinars is because it's authentic, right? It's not yeah. scripted. It's not produced. It's, you know, like it doesn't feel scripted. Like when I watch a commercial, when I watch like a, like an educational video, like that's been produced, like it just, it doesn't feel as real as like really watching a webinar. So um, a lot of our customers, I would say like 90% of our customers already run webinars or use video in their marketing regularly. And because they feel this pain so much, it's driving them to make this video. And, or they just take a replay that like they've already done and they mm. use eWebinar to deliver the replay instead of putting it up on YouTube because of the chat component. Because we do have a chat feature that allows you to hop in to respond in real time if you want or if you're there. But if not, you can respond by email. It's just like an intercom or a Zendesk. Like it's no different than any like support chat system. We just built it into our system. So our customers are already fairly versed with using videos and this is just a pain they have to solve 
um, with people that have never done it before. Um, either there's somebody that is like what you mentioned, like they sign up for a trial because they want to do it, but they just, they can't get themselves to the point to actually do it. Or they just feel the pain enough that they're like, I just have to bite the bullet and, and do this myself. But I would say yeah, like I, most I, people already, like they already want to do this once they sign up. Yeah, I mean, it sounds to me, and, I, and I'm talking on my guys' behalf, I mean, this would be the perfect thing to to bring our content guys in to talk to you about. Um, you know, we do webinars regularly and they're all hosted in various places, YouTube or Vimeo, whatever the guys are picking. But I don't know if there's any return on that. And that, that's why I said, you know, you need to get the experts involved. But, you know, we, we have the content. Yeah. But to make it more and more sticky, this sounds like a great marriage in in just using what you're already doing and just making it a bit more rich. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a and, – and don't forget, like, when you upload an older video – there's interruptions, right? Like people asking questions that aren't relevant, like that aren't relevant to you. Some people actually cut that out. Yes. That. Yeah. Some people cut that out before they, before they actually make it a replay experience. Uh, but there's also no lead capture, which is the most <laughs> important thing, right? Like, why are you in business? Right? Because, uh, because you want to capture those leads and you want to convert them. You want to nurture them. I think there is definitely a place for like, you know, things like YouTube, Vimeo, like um, Wistia, right? Like if you want the impressions, right? If you want the views, like we have videos that aren't gated because we just want the views. But for videos where, you know, maybe it is a lead, it, it is lead gen content, or maybe it does have competitive content that you don't just want to put out there, you know, into the internet. Um, what eWebinar does is we, we, when we say we deliver it like a webinar, you go to a registration page, you select the time, you put in your name, email, or whatever questions you want to ask. Like, so people still have to register like any other event. It actually starts, if you say, I want, I want to watch this tomorrow at 12, it does start at a certain time. Like while you can watch it on demand, like not everybody wants to watch it at the time of discovery. They just have the option, right? We're all about giving people the option. So that's why people show up. They can still choose a time slot where they've dedicated that half hour, 60 minutes to actually consume that content. So having it on eWebinar is not just about the rich experience and, and all that. It's also about like gating that content when you want to. Yeah, I can, I can see how you, how that's valuable. I mean, you're still giving the end user experience that you want and you need to create some of those things like scarcity and, and I can't know what it is now, but, but to, that drives a human to go and watch it still. Otherwise, if it's if it's too freely available, they won't they won't get stuck into it. Well, they're also like, uh, I can just get back to it later, right? Like if yeah. you're you know yeah. you've got a tab open and then you're like, okay, well I can pause this and then just just come back to it later and then maybe you don't, maybe you do, but there isn't like you're not committed, right? Like with an e-webinar, if you choose like I want to I want it to start at twelve, like that's it, like you can't pause the video, you have like just like a real experience. If you do have to go midway, like you will have a follow-up email that gives you the replay link. And when you watch the replay, you can still control the video because that's the expected behavior. So we kind of mimic that environment. It's it's just human psychology, right? Like it it mm-hmm. works, be, like it's, that's why Zoom is a big company, right? Like people like this experience um, and we're just mimicking that. Yeah, makes sense. No, I get that. I had a question here around you're creating the video and i wondered if it wasn't maybe worth and i don't know how community driven your your once someone signed up do they talk to other people that are on the platform and maybe that was an opportunity to almost crowdsource your audience for your first video or get tips and tricks and or, or you know trial and error with, with almost trusted friends yeah i would say like we we've kind of come to terms with if it if you need help like that much help creating your first video mm-hmm. you're not our ideal customer like it's not to say that we don't have customers that do that like the reason why we don't offer so much help um we do have like consultants that we like bounce people to but we don't we're not like actively encouraging that because we're a start, like we're a bootstrap startup so our effort has to go towards people who are already experienced creating videos otherwise like if you need that much lift, like maybe you'll churn, you, maybe you don't convert after your trial. Like we want to support you as, as much as we can, but we also have to just own up to the fact that you, you're you just not our, like our ICP. 
Otherwise, like we're, it's also taking time away from us trying to get in front of people who already know video and come in. Like some people come into eWebinar and they publish within five minutes. Some people pay for three, four months before they put their video up, right? Because they want, they want paying for the software to encourage them <laughs> to actually get this going. Some people get 20 of them running within the first two months. Like I don't, I don't actually know the difference between all these. Like I, and when I talk to my customers, I just know that like, some people feel the pain more than others. Um, and so they're more motivated. So we don't have a community that, that people tap into right away. It's also because we're just such a small startup that we don't have the manpower to, to manage these communities. I still see people creating Facebook communities for their software and things like that. I think that's a very brave move. I mean, it's a, the internet, the internet can be a very scary place if you are, yeah. yeah, you know, if you're not managing that and, um, and, and seeing like what people are just putting out there for, for the open. Like I would say that we're not like as mature as, as some other companies that have like a, a community manager, um, to make sure that like the conversations that are happening are, you know, are good. And if people like throw out a complaint that we can actually manage that. But that's definitely like something we want to do in the future because it's not just about video creation, right? It's like best practices. Like, how do I get someone to stay till the end? Like, why yeah. isn't my presentation working? Can you review that? Like, we have a lot of people that come through that says, oh, this uh, automated webinars don't work for me because I didn't make a sale. But a lot of times it's not like the software doesn't work for you, right? Like, it's how do you structure a presentation so that you can sell to someone without talking to them. That's a different art, right? When you get someone on the phone, like you can manage their, like you know how they're feeling, you know their objections, you manage that right away. People know how to, like people in sales know how to sell one-on-one, -on -one. but in a world where people don't want to be sold to, how do you structure a presentation to get people to a close without talking to them? And that's something that um, we teach as a company, uh, and, but that's a different that's a different approach to sales. And that's where I think a community can can really help is like, how do I get into this new way of selling or how do I get people to the end? How do I create, you know, a, a compelling presentation? Right. How do I how do I speak in a way that um, people understand without without real time feedback? Right. So I think in the future, like we definitely want to create a community sh to share those best practices we're just not really at the place yet where we're brave enough to, to put it out there. <laughs> sure. I mean, I'm just thinking about how you would approach. I mean, it's a typical webinar, at least the ones that I've been involved in, is, is usually some subject matter expert talking about two or three things that they've done or, or that they've used XYZ product to, to achieve those things. I mean, the alternative is, is a couple of experts talking about a topic and, you know, people just listening and, and you might get a few questions while you're talking, but again, your, your, you know, your low attendance will drive what, how, how few questions you get or how many questions you get. But I almost, as you were talking, I was thinking, well, maybe there's a, instead of it being a webinar which is focused one to many, you do the webinar focused one to one, even though you're expecting to go to many. Yeah, and that's exactly what we are. Like, yeah. I mean, there's about 200 people that join our demo every month. There's about 100 people that will join our onboarding, right? So a lot of people just want to figure it out on their own. And we make the software pretty intuitive and pretty easy to understand that like once you upload a video, like the, the software kind of guides you through the next steps. But I don't do those demos. At the very, like at the most, there are two people in my demo at the same time. So mm -hmm. you can imagine like if you run one, one webinar a month, maybe 300 people sign up, uh, 50 people show up, and then maybe like 25 people stay till the end. And then you try to like get them to watch the replay, or maybe you cut up the video and then you try to like market them little snippets, right? But with any webinar, because you can join at any time, people, they, they, they don't have to sign up for a single session, right? That's why like maybe 200 people show up, but only one person joins at a time. And the benefit of that is not just they can watch it at their time, it's the chat is so much more manageable, right? When 200 people are in your webinar, 50 people are in your webinar, even if half of them say hi, it's unmanageable, right? So like you're trying to talk and then you try to also click on the Q&A or click on the chat box. So there's a lot of people that, a lot of companies that will have two people 
doing one webinar. So how inefficient is that for, for use of time? Right. So mm. that's why, like, we have companies that use eWebinar to run over a hundred different webinars every single month. And they have like two people that kind of just manages the chat like throughout the day. And it's the same people as, as the support team. So from a scale perspective, like instead of doing two, three webinars live a month, you're able to do like over a hundred sessions. I mean, that's like, just think about the impact that could have in your business. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about the internal now. Uh, and I'm thinking about like a, the, 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 the town halls you go and attend and it's always, a, it's always a pain because you've got to try and get multiple geographic locations onto the same call. And, it, and, you know, is it 12 o'clock in the UK and then six o'clock in India and, and you know, three o'clock in the morning in, in the US, for example, how do you do that? But if you go and record that as a webinar on your platform, for example, and you, yeah. you allow that, that webinar to be available for two weeks and yeah. you're recording it once, but now all the questions are coming in as people watch it, your yeah. stickiness would be so much higher. Well, and also the chat goes directly, say, to the CEO, right? Like yeah. if it's if it's some sort of company update or whatever it might be. And it actually makes people feel special, right? So it, it is like webinars are typically one to many. We deliver them almost as a private experience. The chat is just between the attendee and the moderator, and you can have multiple moderators if you want. But not everyone can run a webinar, but anyone can respond to one. So you could have the CEO do, you know, a company update, you know, for your town hall and the, you know, the CEO is the moderator, but his assistant could be managing the chat as him. So you could watch it over the next two weeks, but you still feel like you have a direct channel to the CEO. And that's just relationship building, right? Whether it's internal mm -hmm. or external, right? Like my, like for my demo, the chat comes to me directly and it does come to me directly like because i want to i want to be able to to talk to anyone that comes through but people feel special and they are right because they're they're now talking to the creator of the company like the the founder and they like ask different questions and they think it's pretty neat when like when they get to do that yeah and i think we've also progressed as a, as a species to enjoying text communications yeah, if you look at yeah. if you look how prodigious whatsapp is or telegram or any of those things um we were staying at a hotel this, week, this last week and you could you could communicate with anyone in the hotel staff via WhatsApp. And yeah, that's amazing. So much easier. You know, yeah. oh, I need to go change a room, or there's a maintenance issue, or whatever it is. Because now, you know, going to find the hotel phone to phone somebody and then explain to X person what you want to do, and then they they navigate you to someone else. You know, that just puts you off the phone call because you should be dealing with the kids or going for breakfast or, or whatever it is. Um, yeah. So I, could, I mean, so I can see the power. There are people that are switching from live webinars to us. Um, and, you know, like anyone that's doing a live webinar right now, they're doing it on Zoom or, or something like it, right? Or live storm, yep. or whatever it might be. And their number one worry is if I can't respond to somebody right away, like by voice, because it's a webinar, because that, that's what they're used to, right? Somebody asks a question, I respond to them. If I don't respond to them by voice, is that impersonal? Do I need to... Like, do I need to get them to hop into a Zoom room at the end so they can hear me? And I'm like, just give this a try. Like, because our communication is all text-based. Just give yeah. it a try. Because you will be so surprised how little people want to talk to you. <laughs> like, I know yeah. that that's what you're used to. And sometimes that is a leap. And it's a completely legitimate worry um, and objection. But just try it. Because people actually don't want to hop on a call. Like they just, they just want to text. And, and if there is a question that is so complicated that you can't respond to on text then send them your calendar and set up a call outside of that. But do you have to respond by voice in real time in order to be sincere as a vendor? No, right? Like your customers don't expect you to be available 24 seven. Like they, just be authentic about that, right? Like, and that's why, like, within our chat, they like we allow you to program an, an autoresponder, like that yeah. comes up uh, in a couple minutes. Like, um, if if you don't respond, it just says like, hey, we've got your message. Well, if you don't hear back from us right away, like, you will get an email. And that's no different than like any website you go to, and there's like a little chat bubble that that comes up. But I think there's a, there is a risk there. I stop being a customer of organizations that use chatbots. Because I find the chatbot experience incredibly frustrating. 
Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do text and I'm happy to talk yeah. to someone over text because usually what I need to know is very simple. Or at least I think it's very simple. And, and another human can interpret what I want and respond yeah. to it. Even if the response is, we'll come back to you in two days' time. Yeah. That's fine. But going through a, and very similar to the telephonic IVR system, yeah. press <laughs> one, press that. two, press 11, yeah. whatever it is, those things, as much as they're meant to increase, supposedly increase productivity, I think those actually do the exact opposite. And they, and they you know, irritate people to the point that they don't phone in. Um, yeah. I totally, I totally agree. Yeah. That's why we like the most we have is the autoresponder. Like we don't try to be something else. Um, and I like the, I also get it because sometimes companies have just so many customers that they have to go that route, but it's also really annoying if you're choosing your own adventure, but you can't get to submit your own question. Exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. And and, or like you're, you're screaming on the phone and they don't understand agent. So now you're like screaming agent. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, because, I mean, some of them do have, have good sort of things where you type your question and it's starting to bubble up KBAs and say, okay, you know, this is the article we think will help you, whatever it is, which is fine. But as long as I know that I can talk to a human still at any point in the process. Yeah. Um, and, and often, even just even that security of talking to a human is there, but you can answer, the questions probably answered in the first or second KBA. That's, that's, that's fine too. But there's too many of these where the only option um, yeah. is to talk to a robot and, and that robot is, is not well trained and not well versed in human. Um, so I think that's the risk, but if you might, if you're not doing that, then that's great. Um, I wanted to ask you a question around your team. You mentioned that, that, that this is your third, um, business with, with people being remote. I mean, where, where are the people? Yeah. So not only is everyone remote, I also came into comp- this company knowing that I don't want any employees. So I love building businesses, but I'm actually incredibly bad at managing people. Like I really suck and I love my freedom. Um, So coming into this, I wanted not just a remote team, but everyone has to be a contractor. It doesn't mean they're not full time. It just means that they're a free agent. And if they wanted a side project, they can do that. Like, but the company benefit is not like, you know, fancy offices or, you know, healthcare packages and things like that. It's like you have complete freedom to do anything you want. And hopefully you're here because you believe in the mission and and things like that. So of course we're in the Netherlands right now. Uh, We've got people in Vancouver, uh, New York, um, Belarus. Uh, Our majority of our dev team is in uh, Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh because we, we love Vietnam and that's actually why it was the primary reason why we chose that because we, we wanted to, to go visit them periodically. But it also, having that mentality also allows us to hire from, like for talent anywhere in the world, yeah. right? And, and that's really important, I think, especially as a bootstrap startup, like how do you optimize on costs is you have to go elsewhere. Like we, we couldn't hire in North America even if we wanted to. Yeah. It just it's financially not viable. Like we can't hire in Europe if we wanted to. Like how do we compete? Right? Mm-hmm. So um we're now also looking in in Costa Rica. Um and the reason is because we like after the past two years, everybody's outsourcing. They realize, oh, actually, I don't have to hire a developer locally in order for them to be productive when everyone's working at home and productivity actually went up, not down. And actually hiring elsewhere is much cheaper. And then you don't have to worry about like labor laws and and things like that, right? So um, now that everyone has gone to outsourcing, it's gotten exponentially harder for companies like us um, that need to outsource because now we're competing with the huge companies. And then of course, all these dev shops would rather work with companies that can grow to a team of five or 10 in a very short period and not work with us who is hiring like, you know, one at a time. So we need to be more creative to, to see like where we can hire talent um, for what we can afford, which has added like a new level challenge. Um, but, you know, we've we've always done it this way. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's funny you say um, everyone's outsourcing now. Um, I think I think that switch that everyone took that you could hire outside of your, your geographic, geographic region even just outside your time zone, you know, there's an acceptable plus two, minus two that you'll yeah. take or, um, 
you know, when you're hiring through an agency platform that's doing your payroll for you or handling all the legal stuff just so you pay one amount and yeah. you don't have any of that other stress. I think those are good things, but I hear what you're saying in the sense of competitiveness. I mean, I worked for a few corporates and you know, the amount of people we'd outsource to, um, if we decided not to outsource, you know, that would have a significant impact on our region. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's a scary, not so scary thought, but it's, it's a daunting factor that you, you could make or break someone's region. Um, yeah, based on on a contract negotiation, but it's, I suppose that's that that'll go through its cycle and, and should get better. Uh, I've been interested in in uh, Portugal at the moment because I see them mm. doing quite a lot around uh, nomads and and tax breaks and incentives to come and work there. Is yeah. is that how you decide where you go? Like, do you look at where you can be based that that gives you the best benefits, or is it just places you want to see? And um, <laughs> it's more like. <laughs> I mean, number one is places we want to see. Um, that's very important yeah. because I think, like, I spent a better decade, I guess, building two other businesses where, like, work was everything. Because it had to be. Like, I was kind of building my career and and I didn't have a lot. Um, but coming into eWebinar, um, I wanted to build a business where, like, there's work-life balance, but life comes first. So our company culture is very, very much like that. And, and yeah, we, we pick a lot of our locations um, based on like, you know, not just access to talent, but like, do we want to go visit there? Like, would it be fun? Would it be fun to go there? Um, so that's definitely, that's definitely primary. Um, but ultimately it's just like what's available, right? Like how much can we afford and what's like, what's the return? Because the skill level is, is very different, right? Depending on, where you can hire. Like if you're looking at, um, you know, Belarus, for example, we worked with a dev shop from there, but this dev shop primarily works with U.S. startups. So the skill level is U.S. startups. Um, mm. And like, but, you know, while we, a majority of our team is in Vietnam, they're not exposed to the same level of education. And I don't mean like education in school. I mean, like they're not, building products that are like the Ubers of, of the world. Um, so the skill level that you get is very different. That's why they're half the price. So for us, it's like, where can we optimize, right? Where can we pay the least with the highest ROI? Like, not like yeah. the cheapest, but like, you know, and understand what I mean by like, what is that optimal point? Um, yeah, it's a balance point. Yeah, like what's the balance, right? And, and we really haven't like found our next location yet. That's why we're looking at places like Costa Rica. Um, but I'm not sure yet. Haven't made that conclusion. Where, where's been your favorite place you've been to so far? Well, definitely to live um, is Amsterdam, just because we're. At, that's why we we ended up buying a place here and and settling here. But definitely, I think. Um, I guess Asia would be like Thailand. It's just so culturally, like it's so rich, right? Like it, it's just so different. Like I, I love Europe. Like I love Italy. I, you know, I love France, you know, like there's, it's, it's culturally rich kind of in a different way, right? I guess in Asia, like there's, it's just so populated um, that it's just a different, it's a different experience. So yeah. always like exploring there and um, you know, winters in, in Thailand are the best. Yeah, it's only slightly colder. <laughs> yeah. Is that on the islands or in the, in the cities, like Bangkok? Um, I mean, definitely, like, okay. the you know, I've never actually had a great experience um, on the islands. I think it's because December, January is actually, like, a bad time to go to the islands. Oh. I was actually, my first time in Thailand, we were in Koh Samui, and we were meant to go for, like, four or five days, but there was, like, the biggest monsoon that happened like for years. And then we ended up being stuck there for like 10 days with like, like everything was flooded. Nothing was being delivered. I was actually surprised the hotels were still running, but everything was flooded and all the yeah. flights were like, all the flights were canceled. So that was my first experience. And we went, we went early January. So since then we uh, stopped going to the islands in the winters. Yeah. You, you gotta be careful. We, we, we normally go September, August. Um, and that's, that's, that's the end of the season, but, but before the monsoons kick in, so it's not, not too bad. No, it's one of my favorite places too. Um, really, really have a lot, a lot of good times there. Uh, so 
Agreed. Um, what is your what is your digital workspace setup? I mean, what what have you got as your kit? Yeah. So um, software wise, it's I mean, it's definitely primarily Slack. Right. I, I can't imagine really using anything else. Um, I remember before that we were on like Skype and then there would be like messenger <laughs> like and, and then text, like any anything that we could like anything we could use to find other people like we would be on there. Um, definitely like Google Docs, Google Drive. Um, hard to get away from that. Um, but. Right now, like my hardware setup is like I've got a little ring light that I could like because we travel so much, everything has to be mobile. Um, yeah. And we like so we've got a little ring light if we're going to check our luggage. But I've also got like one of those cubes that attach like those cube lights that attach to the back of your laptop. If I like if I wasn't checking in a luggage, which nowadays um, you really shouldn't be checking in luggage because you might never see it again. Um, and I've got the little Especially like a little. Detail, yeah. Yeah, a little tripod that I could put my um, put my phone on because I use a camo that turns your phone into a webcam. So that is like the best webcam is in your pocket. Um, and then I've got um, this Audio Technica mic that I find is like the absolute best mic, especially for like if you're recording podcasts, um, would highly, highly recommend that. Um, otherwise, that's it. It's it's actually super simple um, for recording videos. We either use Loom or we use Descript. Um, and then we've now started using the kind of the voicemail feature on on Slack as well. Um, but we just try to keep it super simple and super lean. So, so I need to ask you a, a question around Descript because I, I've for years used um, Otter AI for mm. our transcripts. Yeah, but I couldn't. I found that the quality of the transcripts were okay. I mean, you know, maybe sixty percent accurate, maybe seventy yeah. percent at best. Uh, and a few people have recommended these scripts. I mean, what? How do you pick a tool? And you know, if you talk about these scripts as an example, what what made you use that one? I mean, that software. It's like one of those solutions that you're like, I would never want to run this startup, but I'm so glad it exists. Like you just like that software is so magical like that because what I what I use, what I need to use it for is not just the transcript um, because I don't always publish the transcript, but like it's like basic editing because all we do is video. So when I make a before Descript, my 20 minute demo would take me eight hours to record because I couldn't figure out Camtasia like I'm not actually that tech savvy. So even the basic, like cutting this part out or like I wanted to cut out this filler word, I said, um, or maybe I was silent for too long. Like that would take forever. So when I saw Descript, like what it does is it takes your video, it automatically transcribes it. But not only that, you could remove bits and pieces of the video or rearrange the order of something by copying and pasting the text and deleting text on that transcript. Or if you had like a gap of like 10 seconds, you wanted to make one second, you basically just drag the timeline and then you shorten that gap. So the idea that not only it like automatically spits out a transcript, but you actually edit the video using that transcript was so magical. So now I could actually record anything I want knowing I could do that. So if I said something wrong, I would just pause and then I would say it over again. And all I had to do was delete that gap. So it's the first solution that I found that was just like actually life changing. And yeah, like wow. the transcript um, is like, I would say like 60 to 80 percent accurate, depending on like how many names there are. Like they still like you can't add words, right? Like I can't it still doesn't learn e webinar. It always makes it the webinar. But yeah, it's like something I'm able to live with because the primary reason I use that is for editing. But also the other thing they're super good for is exporting snippets of videos. So if I took like one 10 minute video and I wanted to make a preview, I just highlight the words that I want that snippet to be. And I just hit export and that's it. I don't have to like find the time that it begins and then find the time that it ends on this timeline and then export it. So it's it's really the first video editing software that I had figured out. 
Um, and we loved it so much that we now have a, have a partnership with them. So we're integrated with them. And so any Dscript video can like directly go inside a webinar. But yeah, like I, I have heard of Otter. I think I've, I've looked at it in the past, but I think it was like much, much more expensive than, than what we were willing to pay for that particular uh, feature. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not a competition between the two. Uh, I just had, had heard that Dscript was, was very good for various reasons, but I'm not really sure why. Um, well, I mean, we're pretty much out of time. So is there anything that you want to finish up with or maybe just give us some contact details for people to get in touch with you? Yeah. Um, if you want to connect with me, the best way is through LinkedIn. Um, just look up Melissa Kwan, K-W-A-N. And if you are doing webinars and you're sick of them or you want to do webinars, but you don't want to do them live, um, just come to our website, check out eWebinar. It's exactly as it sounds ewebinar.com. Um, there's a demo on our site that you can join on demand. Um, and if you have a question for me, just type it in the chat box and I will be managing the chat. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much for giving us your time today. Uh, it sounds like a really great product. Yeah, and I wish you all the best with it. <laughs> thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Heather Bicknell is our producer and editor. Thank you, Heather, for your hard work on this episode. Please subscribe to the series and rate us on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Follow us on Twitter at the DWW Podcast. The show notes and transcripts will be available on the website, www.digitalworkspace.works. Please also visit our website, www.digitalworkspace.works, and subscribe to our newsletter. And lastly, if you found this episode useful, please share with your friends or colleagues.